So we're going to get started. Um, we're very excited to have uh, our esteemed guest tonight. Uh, Richard doesn't need any ex uh, introduction. Everybody knows who RMS is, uh, or you wouldn't be here, actually. Uh, he comes to us straight from Berlin, which is kind of cool, where he was inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame. And, uh, I expected to see a giant coil to perform <laughs> the induction. Ah. <laughs> ah, could you plug this in now? Sure. Now it can reach. So, for those who came in early, there are probably still stickers out there that you can take when you leave. And there are still various books, shirts, and buttons, and these metal stickers that say GNU slash Linux inside that you can buy when I'm done. So, first, a couple of requests for you. If you take photos of me, please do not put them in Facebook. Facebook is a monstrous surveillance engine. It does surveillance on its users. It does surveillance on everyone else through like buttons. So if you put the photo of someone in Facebook, you give Facebook another way to surveil that person. Please don't do that to me. Second, if you make a recording of this talk and you want to distribute copies, Please do so only in the formats and the ways that are favorable to free software. First, that this relates to the formats for audio and video. Uh, the formats that are favorable to free software are the OGG formats and WebM. So please do not use MP anything. P especially don't use Flash. <laughs> And of course, don't use Windows Media Player or QuickTime to distribute my talks. Now, also please make sure that the file can be accessed without running any non-free JavaScript code. So this rules out YouTube in two ways, because first of all, YouTube distributes Flash, which is bad. And when it distributes WebM, it ruins that by requiring you to run a non-free JavaScript program to access it, which makes it bad. And also, please put on the recording the Creative Commons No Derivatives license, because this is a presentation of a point of view. There are seats remaining. There are a few over there. There are a couple over there, and a few back there, and a few on that side, too. So unless you're thinking of scooting out in a few minutes and you want to make sure that's easy, you might as well sit down. So what is free software? Free software is software that respects the user's freedom and community. So it's a matter of freedom, not price. Think of free speech, not free beer. If a program is not free, that means it denies freedom to its users. A non-free program generates a system of unjust power. It's a kind of digital colonization and like any colonial system, the victims are kept divided and helpless. Divided because they're forbidden to redistribute the software and helpless because they don't have the source code. <clears throat> so they can't change it. They can't even independently verify what it really does to them. And quite likely, it's doing something nasty, intentionally nasty, and I'll give more details in a few minutes. So, non-free software is an injustice. It should not exist. 
But what I've said is very general. Free software respects the user's freedom and community. I'd better be more specific if you want to take this seriously. A program is free software if it gives the user the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code of the program and change it to make the program do your computing as you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help others. That's the freedom to redistribute exact copies of the program when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others when you wish. By the way, would it be possible to get me some cold water? Sure. Tap water is fine, but if it's in a bottle, please make sure it's not from Coca-Cola Company. <laughs> <laughs> There's a worldwide boycott of Coca-Cola Company for murdering union organizers in Colombia and Guatemala. Take a look at killercoke.org if you want more info. So, <clears throat> if the program comes with these four freedoms adequately, then it's free software because the social system of its distribution and use is an ethical one that respects freedom and community. But if one of these four freedoms is missing or insufficient, then it's proprietary software because it imposes an unethical social system on its users. In order for these freedoms to be adequate, they have to apply to all activities in life. So if someone says, this program is free software for educational use, he's wrong. It's not free software if it has that restriction. But note that these four freedoms are not obligatory. You're free to do these things. You're, not, you're never required to do any of them. For instance, with freedom zero, you're free to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose. Well, who's been drinking from it so far? No, I don't like to share bacteria. <laughs> you know, that's bad like sharing copies of non-free software. <laughs> so with Freedom Zero, you're free to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose, but it's not required. If you're a masochist, you can run it as you don't wish. <laughs> you also have the option of not running the program. With Freedom 1, you're free to study and change the source code, but it's not required. You can get the program and put it in your machine and run it without looking at anything. With Freedom 2, you're free to redistribute copies to anyone, you know, give them away, sell them. What, but it's up to you whether to distribute a copy to anybody in particular. You're not ordered to cooperate with other people, but you're free to do so. And with Freedom 3, if you've made a modified version, you're free to distribute copies of that, but it's not required. You can use your version privately, and then it's private software, which is okay. It's free software in a trivial sense. There's only one user that has a copy of that program, and all one users have the four freedoms. So, as you can see, the distinction between free software and proprietary software is not a technical distinction. It's not a question of what features it has. It's not a question of how they work. It's not a question of how the code was written. Those are all technical details. This is a social, ethical, and political distinction, which is why it's so important. Thank you. Hmm. I 
I noticed the bottle he has is pole and spring water. That's because they bring it in on pogo sticks. <laughs> I'll tell you one at the end. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the use in society of a free program is development. Every program embodies knowledge. If it's free software, that knowledge is available to the users for them to understand. They can maintain, adapt, and extend the program. They can also use their knowledge in other ways. But if a program is proprietary, its use in society is not development because it's dependence, imposed dependence on one particular entity. That's a social problem. If we see people using a proprietary program, we should aim to put an end to that usage, to put an end to the social problem. Writing a free program is a, and releasing it is a contribution to society. Bec now, how much of a contribution, that depends on the details. If it does something very useful and does it well, that's a big... I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, Richard. Sorry, folks. <laughs> if it does something very useful and does it well, that's a big contribution. If it does very little and does it badly, that's a small contribution. But if the program is released as free software, then at least it's available in such a way that it can contribute whatever it has to offer. However, <laughs> writing a proprietary program is no contribution because it's a power grab. It's an attempt to subjugate people. In social terms, that proprietary program is a trap. If it has attractive features, those are the bait. Paradoxically, they don't make the proprietary program better. They make it more harmful. Think about it. A proprietary program that works very badly is not going to subjugate very many people. But if it's attractive, then a lot of people might fall into the trap. Which means that if you have the choice to either develop a proprietary program or do nothing at all, you should do nothing at all because that way you're not doing harm to society. Now, in real life, you'd probably have other options which might be better than both of these. But if it's just a matter of comparing these two, you should do nothing. <clears throat> so, the aim of the free software movement is for all programs to be free so that all their users are free. But what makes these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each freedom has a reason. Freedom two, the freedom to redistribute copies, exact copies, is essential on fundamental moral grounds so that you can lead an upright ethical life as a good member of your community. If you use a program without freedom too, you're in danger of falling into a moral dilemma at any moment whenever your good friend says, that program is nice, could I have a copy? At that moment, you will face a moral, a choice between two evils. One evil is to give your good friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to refuse your good friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. If you are in this dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil, which is to give your good friend a copy and violate the license of the program. Why is this the lesser evil? <clears throat> well, 
if you can't avoid doing wrong to somebody or other, it's less bad to do the wrong to somebody who deserves it because he's done wrong. <laughs> we can assume that your good friend is a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. By contrast, the owner of this proprietary program will have, by, has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community, which is very bad. So if you have to do wrong to your good friend or the owner, do it to the owner. However, being the lesser evil does not make it good. It's never good to make an agreement and break it. Not even an evil agreement like this one, where keeping it is worse than breaking it. Still, breaking it is not good. And if you give your good friend a copy, what will she have? She will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program which is a rather nasty thing, almost as nasty as an authorized copy of the same program. <laughs> so, when you fully understood this dilemma, what should you really do? You should make sure you never fall into the dilemma. I know two ways. One is, don't have any good friends. <laughs> Instead, you can have Facebook friends. <laughs> That's the future that the proprietary software developers have in mind for you. <clears throat> the other method, my method, is don't have that software. Don't use it. If someone offers me a program, no matter how attractive it might be, on the condition that I not distribute copies to you, I say, my conscience does not permit me to accept those conditions, so take your nasty software out of here. And that's what you should tell them also. And you should reject the propaganda terminology that they use to demonize cooperation and sharing. Terms like pirate. When they call people who share pirates, what are they really saying? They are saying that helping other people is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. <laughs> Which, morally speaking, is as wrong as you can get because attacking ships is very bad, but sharing is good. So let's not mislead people by using the same word for these two things. Therefore, when, is this for, if, if you want clarification of what I just said, please ask now, otherwise please wait to the end. It's not a road, you said freedom, not free beer. As free in, speech, not free beer. Right, okay. So, you don't have a problem with people charging. Not at all. Right, however, in the case that you give it away to your friend, you take it Yeah, and you're not charging. Yes, but then, that's right, and he's got no right to charge you to distribute to a copy to your friend because that's exercising a freedom you should have. I'm not against saying, here's a copy, I'll give it to you in exchange for X dollars. In fact, I've even done that. Here's the Emacs manual, it's free. It's under a free license but we're selling copies. There's no contradiction there because it's free as in freedom. Copies can be given away. Anybody's free to make copies and give them away or make copies and sell them. We do both. So, no, I don't want to answer a lot of questions now, I'm sorry. Unless you want to understand what I just said, because it wasn't clear, please save the questions for later. So if someone asks me what I think of piracy, I say attacking ships is very bad. <laughs> and if someone asks me what I think of movie piracy, I say I like the first Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs>
So you get the point. I'm looking for a funny way to reject their propaganda. So that's the reason for freedom too. The freedom to redistribute exact copies when you wish, essential on basic moral grounds. Freedom zero, to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose, is essential for a different reason. So you can have control over your own computing. There are proprietary programs whose licenses restrict even the use of the authorized copies. For instance, there, was, there is, or at least was, a proprietary program for running a website which had a license that said it was forbidden to use it to publish anything that criticized the prog program's developer. <laughs> so in this case, proprietary software literally denies the user's freedom of speech. If you can't even freely use the copy that's provided for you to use, you don't have control of your computing. So freedom zero is essential. But it's not enough because that only means you're free to do or not do whatever things the code of the program is already set up to do, which means that the owner still imposes his decisions on you, not through the license if you have freedom zero, but instead through the code itself. So, in order to have control of your computing, you need freedom one, the freedom to study that source code and change it to make that program do computing the way you want it to. <clears throat> now, one wrinkle of this is, it's not always enough just to get the source code and be allowed to change it. You've got to be able to get your version to run in the computer instead of the version you got, if it's possible at all to change the software in that machine, if it's not a physical ROM, if it's designed so some modified versions can be installed and it's normal to install modified versions, you've got to be able to install your modified version. And there are devices that are made which block this. They will only run the versions provided by the owner and if you've changed it, they won't run your version. We call those devices tyrants, and that's not freedom. That's, that's sort of a, a theoretical uh, pretense of freedom one instead of a real practical freedom one. Could you explain that a minute? What, if you've got the source code, you can change anything. You can change the source code. Listen, listen, is. listen. Okay. They're designed based on signatures. They, they, ref they shut down if the signature doesn't check. And we don't have the signature key, so we can't sign them. Some Android devices are set up this way, and others are not. Um, anyway, if you don't have the freedom one because you don't have the source code, then you can't even tell what the program is doing to you. And often it's designed to do something nasty. Many commonly used proprietary programs have malicious functionalities that spy on the user, restrict the user, and there are even back doors to abuse the user. And this is not an unusual thing. In fact, almost everyone in the world that's using proprietary software is using proprietary malware. This, being the victim of this sort of mistreatment is the usual case among people who use proprietary software. Let me prove it with a list of examples. One proprietary package that has all three of those kinds of malicious functionalities that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. <laughs> people have found specific spy features in it. Of course, the DRM, digital restrictions mechanisms, those are visible to the user. They can't hide the fact that the, it's designed to refuse to do things. That doesn't make it acceptable, though. The back doors are not so easy to see, but we know of two of them. So Windows literally is malware, <laughs> software designed to hurt the user. 
worse, one of these backdoors is universal. It allows Microsoft to remotely install software changes, whatever software changes it chooses to install. Which means that any malicious functionality not in Windows today could be remotely installed tomorrow. So Windows is universal malware. Other examples of malware include MacOS, which has digital restrictions management. But the iThings, the newer Apple computers, are even worse. Several spy features were found in them. They have the tightest digital handcuffs ever. Apple was the pioneer with the iThings in restricting even the user's choice of which application programs to install. Apple uses the iThings as a platform for censorship, arbitrary censorship according to its business interests. This ought to be illegal. And the users, recognizing how nasty this was, coined a term for what they did when they found ways to break those particular handcuffs. They call it jailbreaking, recognizing that these computers are designed as jails for their users. <clears throat> More, so the software in Apple's computers is malware. More examples, Flash Player is malware. It has a surveillance functionality and digital handcuffs. Well, Flash Player is gratis, but it's not free software. And this demonstrates that price is not important. What's important is freedom. The fact that Flash Player is gratis means that Adobe does not require users to pay to be abused. <laughs> Another example is Angry Birds. <laughs> Angry Birds is spyware. Another example is the software in the Amazon Swindle. <laughs> that's not its official name, but that's the appropriate name because that ebook reader is designed so that it swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, there's the freedom to buy a book anonymously, paying cash, something I did a few times today. It's the only way I get books. I do not want anybody's database to know what books I have or what books I've read. But that's impossible with the swindle. Amazon makes users identify themselves Amazon <coughs> maintains a giant database of all the books that each user has read and exactly which time that user read each page. And this is a threat to human rights. We must not tolerate the existence of such a database anywhere in the world about us. So it doesn't matter whether it's Amazon or somebody else that has this database it's unacceptable for it to be made. Then there's the freedom to give the book to someone else after you read it, or lend it to various friends, or sell it to a used bookstore. Amazon abolishes these freedoms with some digital restrictions mechanisms. Well, I call it that and digital handcuffs, they're the same and also with contracts imposed on the readers which demonstrate contempt for private property because Amazon says that the users of the swindle can't own books. They can only get a license to read a book under Amazon's restrictive conditions. All of your books are belong to us. <laughs> and then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish. Amazon abolishes this freedom with a back door. Now we don't know all the things that this back door can do because we only know about it by observation. We know it can be used to remotely erase books. We know this because in 2009, Amazon did remotely erase thousands of copies of a particular book. 
copies that until that day were authorized copies. The users had obtained them from Amazon in the approved fashion. They were authorized copies until one day they disappeared. Somebody came to my talk and said he was reading the book and it disappeared. <laughs> An Orwellian act destroying all those books. And what was the, the book? It was 1984 by George Orwell. <laughs> there was a lot of criticism. I saw an article saying, Amazon uses up a year's supply of irony. <laughs> so Amazon promised it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. <laughs> Yeah, if you've read 1984, that's not very comforting, is it? <laughs> but don't worry, Amazon didn't keep its promise anyway. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> the real name of this product, as I'm sure you know, is the Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire. I guess that's meant to suggest its real purpose is virtually burning other people's books. <laughs> so, you should all read 1984, but not on the swindle. You shouldn't use that. It's to use such a device, and it's not the only one that has this nasty aspect, is to become antisocial. If your friend starts reading books that he can't lend you and is forbidden to lend you, he has broken off his friendship with everyone that reads. Make sure your friends know what this act would imply before they do it, before they pay money to get a swindle and then they feel that because they spent it they have to get something out of it. Warn them before they do it so that they won't do it. And my last example is nearly all portable phones. They have a surveillance functionality that they will transmit the GPS location on remote command. And they have a universal backdoor that allows somebody to remotely install software changes without asking the owner's permission. <clears throat> And that has been used to remotely convert them into listening devices. When it's converted into a listening device, it listens all the time and it transmits all the conversation it hears. And you don't need to talk into the microphone. It can listen to you from across the room, inside of a bag. And if you try to switch it off so you won't be uh, eavesdropped on, it pretends to switch off and keeps on running and keeps on listening and transmitting without, as always, without showing any sign that it's doing so. This is why I refer to portable phones as Stalin's dream. <laughs> what Stalin would have liked to do, I'm sure, but couldn't possibly achieve, our society has achieved. Well, I've now listed examples that include nearly all the users of proprietary software. But then there's still thousands of other proprietary programs which might or might not have malicious functionalities. We've probably never heard of most of them. And we can't tell if they have malicious functionalities because we can't get the source code. So we have to treat all of them as potential malware. We don't know whether they're malware or not. And the same party that might have made them malware is also preventing us from checking them. So every program without Freedom 1 essentially is just trust us software. It demands blind faith in a corporation. So they're saying, 
Trust us, no corporation ever mistreated people. <laughs> well, I'm sure there are some of those programs which have no malicious functionalities. We can't identify any, but I'm sure some exist. What can we say about them? They have bugs because their developers are human, so they make mistakes. It's inevitable. And the user of a program without Freedom 1 is just as helpless facing an accidental error as facing an intentional malicious functionality. If you use a program without Freedom 1, you're a prisoner of the code. We, free software developers, are human too. We also make mistakes. It's inevitable. Every non-trivial program has bugs. But if you find a bug in our free code or anything in the code you don't like, you're free to change it because we have not made you a prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. So freedom one is essential, but it's not enough because that's the freedom to personally study and change the source code or do so within one organization. Well, that's not enough because most users are not programmers and they don't know how to do this. But even for a programmer like me, it's not enough because typically if you use a computer, you use thousands of programs and nobody, no one person could possibly study and understand all the source code of so many programs nor personally write all the changes she might have in mind. That's more work than one human being can do. So the only way we can fully have control of our computing is if we work together. That requires freedom three, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. This way, if a group of people wish to, they can work together making the program do what they collectively wish. And when it's working, they can offer copies to everyone else too, if they wish. <clears throat> Without Freedom 3, each one of us would be free to study and change the program, but what a waste that would be to write the same change millions of times, and all the users that don't know how to program would just be left out. This is not good enough, so Freedom 3 is essential. So I've now explained why the four freedoms are essential, and the four freedoms together give us democracy. Because a free program develops democratically under the control of its users. Every user is free to participate as much as he wishes in society's decision about the future of this program, which is simply the sum total of what users decide to do with it. But the proprietary program develops under the sole and total control of its owner. And then serves as a yoke to subjugate users whom the, the owner can then command, exploit, and abuse. Ultimately, with software there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. Free software is the first case. With the four freedoms, the users control the program. Freedoms zero and one give each user individual control over the program. Freedoms two and three allow for collective control over the program. And that's how it ought to be. But if the users don't control the program, then it's the program that controls the users and the owner that controls the program and through it exercises unjust power over its users. <clears throat> Thus, society has a choice to make. On one hand, we have individual freedom, social solidarity, and democracy. On the other, we have a program that is an instrument of unjust power for one entity to command, exploit, and abuse its users. Society must reject proprietary software and choose free software. <clears throat> the aim, the overall aim of the free software movement is the liberation of cyberspace 
including all of its inhabitants. And we invite you to escape from proprietary software and come live with us in the free world that we have built. I started the free software movement in 1983. I wanted to make it possible to use a computer in freedom. This was impossible for modern computers because the computer won't do much of anything without an operating system. And all the operating systems for modern computers in 1983 were proprietary. So if you bought a new computer, in order to make it useful, you had to get an operating system installed, and there went your freedom. So how could I change that? I was one man with not much money and not much fame outside <laughs> of the users of the editor Emacs. And few people agreed with me, so I didn't think we would accomplish much with an ordinary political movement where you protest in the street and send letters to officials. <clears throat> and anyway, I had no experience doing anything like that. I was no political organizer. I was an operating system developer. But as an operating system developer, there was another way I could achieve the same goal. All I had to do was write an operating system then, as the author, I could legally make it free software, and then everybody could use their computers in freedom by running my system. In other words, I could save people from the injustice of proprietary software with technical work in my own field. I was aware of the injustice of proprietary software, which most people then as now did not recognize as an injustice. I had the skill necessary to try to save people from this injustice, and it looked like nobody would do it if not me, which meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this job. It was my duty. It's as if you see somebody drowning, and you know how to swim, and there's no one else around, and it's not Bush. <laughs> then you have a moral duty to save this person. Well, perhaps that statement's too strong. Per perhaps we could identify some other people, like uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld and, and Bush's torturers and the people that protect Bush's torturers, such as Obama, about whom we should not affirm any moral duty to save them. Fortunately, I don't need to resolve all those questions because I don't know how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> However, in the real situation in my life, the work to be done was not swimming. It was writing lots of code, and I knew how to do that. So I decided I would develop an operating system that would be entirely free software. Every line would be free software, because if any piece is non-free, that piece attacks your freedom. <clears throat> then I decided, oh, and by the way, watch out whenever anybody says, something, says that something is based on free software. What, does that, what do those words based on mean? Well, there's so many different things it could mean. You can't tell whether the thing they're developing is free software or not. Maybe that means it is free software. Maybe that means most of it's free software. Maybe that means it isn't free software, but they used a free compiler to compile it. Great for you, right? No good at all for you. Might have been good for them. So when you hear something, a fuzzy statement like based on free software, you've got to probe them and say, is this all free software or not? Will it run in a totally free environment? Can I develop it in a totally free environment? These are the questions you have to use to probe the facts. So then I decided to recruit other people to help write it to get it done sooner. Because the goal wasn't to have a system written entirely by me, the goal was freedom. And the system was a means to that end. Then I decided to make it a Unix-like system so as to have the 
general technical advantages that Unix had compared with other systems of the day and make it compatible with Unix so that all the Unix users could easily switch. Unix was a popular operating system in 1983, but it was proprietary. It had always been proprietary. There's misinformation spreading about that, but no, Unix was never free software. So using Unix was not an option if you wanted to live in freedom, but following the design of Unix was a possibility. And then to give credit to the developers of Unix for their technical ideas, I followed the custom, the tradition of my community by giving my system a recursive acronym name saying this system is not Unix. And the name of the system is GNU, which stands for GNU's not Unix. But why GNU instead of ANU, BNU, FNU, SNU, UNU? Because they're not words. In order for it to be a joke, <laughs> in order for it to be a joke, it needs another meaning. So GNU is a word. It's the name of that animal that lives in Africa. Two meanings. It's a joke. <laughs> but actually. It's better than that. You see, GNU is the most humor-charged word in the English language, <laughs> used in countless word plays, because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and the word is pronounced new. So every time you want to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U and you've got a joke. <laughs> Perhaps not a very good joke, but there are lots of them. So we've been taught to associate this word with laughter. So it's the perfect name for any software project. But when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. Because if you say, I'm using the new operating system, <laughs> You're mistaken, because it's not new anymore. We've been developing it for almost 30 years and using it for 21 years, so it's not new anymore. But it still is and always will be GNU. So please pronounce a hard G when it's the name of our system. There's another pronunciation error you need to avoid, which sounds like Linux. <laughs> How did such a bizarre, gross error get started? Well, it was a confusion that happened in 1992 when we had almost all of the GNU system. See, during the 80s, we had to get hundreds, but then it turned into thousands of components. So I wrote some. I recruited people to write lots more. In some cases, I persuaded people, like the developers of BSD, to free up code that they were releasing as proprietary. And in some cases, somebody else just happened to write a program that would do the job, so I decided to use it. By 1992, we had almost all the system, but one major essential component was missing, the kernel, which is, a, if you have a portable tracking and surveillance device, please <laughs> speak off. They already tracked you here. And I think a recording is being made, so if they want to know what I'm saying, they'll be able to listen. They don't have to listen through your tracking and surveillance device. And the only way to stop it from uh, functioning as a listening device is to remove all the batteries. Hmm. They're starting to make some where people can't remove the batteries. I wonder why. Can you wrap it in an aluminum foil? Well, that would stop it from transmitting at the moment. But what if it buffers up the sound and transmits it later? Anyway, I don't want to go into further details of that particular digression. You've got the point. Anyway, so we were missing this one piece of a kernel. And we started developing a kernel in 1990, but that project was very slow to develop because I picked an advanced, elegant design. 
and various other things went wrong. Anyway, in 1992, Mr. Torvalds, who had written a proprietary kernel called Linux, liberated it. He released the code under a free software license, specifically under the GNU General Public License. Now, that's the license I wrote for releasing most of the components we developed for GNU. It was not the only free software license. There were several others in use at the time. What's special about the GNU GPL is it's a copyleft license, which means there's a condition placed on redistribution. It says you have to pass along the four freedoms when you, when you redistribute. Whether it's exact copies or modified or extended, the whole thing has to carry the same four freedoms. It has to be released under the same license and you have to provide the source code to those people. So essentially, the goal of copyleft is to make sure that when you get your copy, it comes with the same freedom that it carried when it left my hands. And to make sure of that, we have to put conditions on the middlemen to say they're not allowed to strip off the freedom and pass it to you as a proprietary program. So that's the difference between copyleft and other free licenses. The non-copyleft free licenses permit even making proprietary versions of that code. Now, they do allow people to use the code as free software. That's why they qualify as free licenses. But copyleft goes further and actively defends freedom for everyone who's going to get that code, even if other things have been combined with it. So anyway, when Torvalds released his kernel Linux under the GNU GPL, it became free software. And other people put Linux into this gap in the almost complete GNU system and they made a complete free system, which was basically GNU, but also contained Linux. So the appropriate name to call this is the GNU plus Linux system or the GNU slash Linux system. Unfortunately, the people who combined the almost complete GNU system with Linux were focusing so much on this one piece Linux that they perceived all the rest as a small add-on for Linux. And they started talking about this variant of GNU as a Linux system, which means giving us no credit for our work. So it's not nice. <laughs> so when you talk about this system, please don't call it Linux. Please call it GNU plus Linux and give us equal mention. It will require making some effort to change your habit. If you have a habit of calling it Linux and if you're surrounded by other people who don't give us credit, you can still change your habit. There's an easy way to change a habit like that. Make a deal with some friends. Whenever anyone makes the mistake, and someone else catches it, the one who is caught owes the other a dollar. <laughs> and I'm told that this works very quickly and inside of a week, no one will make the mistake anymore. Anyway, this mistake has serious consequences, much more important than just that we don't get credit. The problem is Mr. Torvalds doesn't agree with the free software movement and never did. He's disagreed with us ever since the beginning and he makes this very clear. Well, he's got a right to his views. He doesn't believe that you deserve to have control over your computing. He doesn't believe he deserves to have control over his computing. He thinks that uh, he thinks proprietary software is fine as long as it's powerful and reliable and he's got a right to his views, but he doesn't have the right to present his views on a platform consisting of our work, presenting it as if it were his work. You know, the, the public ought to know 
that, that, that this work is the GNU system and that we did it because we want the users to have freedom. And then if he still wants to, pro to spread those views, he can based on the work he did, but not based on the work we did. That's dangerous for all of you because when people listen to him, they don't learn to value their own freedom and then they won't fight for their freedom and we could all lose it because of the people who didn't learn to care. And there's not, there's not a lot in our society that's telling people that they should think about who controls their computing. It's the free software movement that says this. So we are trying to start the debate about what freedom a user deserves in doing her own computing in the use of a, of a program. We believe that the four freedoms should be inalienable rights that every user has in the use of any program. But when we try to bring these ideas to the attention of the public or even the users of the GNU system, we run into two obstacles. First, the users of the GNU system don't know it's the GNU system. They think it's Linux. They think it was started by Mr. Torvalds. So they admire him tremendously. And they think of us as extremists who didn't do anything. And so when they see the articles where we explain these issues, they say, oh, this comes from those GNU fanatics. Why should I read that? I'm a Linux user. I admire the pragmatic views of Mr. Torvalds. Well, in philosophy, the word pragmatic means the tendency to make long-term important decisions based on short-term factors, which I don't think is necessarily very wise, but they think it's a great thing to be. So they decide not to read what we said. So how ironic, they're using the GNU system and they don't know it, so they ignore us. If they knew that they're using GNU plus Linux, they might say, hmm, I'm a GNU plus Linux user and these are the views of the GNU project, I'd better pay attention. And then we'd have a chance to convince them that they deserve freedom and they should fight for it, and then maybe we'll win. So it makes a difference what you call the system. If you call it GNU plus Linux or GNU slash Linux, you're helping make others aware of where the system came from and why. Every other operating system was developed for technical reasons or commercial reasons. This one was developed for the sake of users' freedom and users need to know this. But today there's another obstacle. In the US media, you rarely see anyone talk about free software. They have another term that they prefer to use, quote, open source, unquote. And the purpose of that term was so that our ideals would be forgotten. <clears throat> During the 90s, there were two political camps in the free software community. There was our camp, the free software movement, and then there was the other camp, the people who participated in the community but didn't see it as an issue of right and wrong. People like Torvalds. And so there was a debate between these two camps and people coming into the community, if they saw the debate, would realize that the free software movement existed. And they would think about what we were saying so our software spread our philosophy. But in 1998, the people in the other camp coined that term open source so that they could talk about the software and disconnect it completely from our principles. And they were the majority and most of the companies in the community were on their side and mostly the journalists and the politicians 
followed the companies, and since then, the spread of our software mostly doesn't clue people in that there is a free software movement. When our work is talked about, it's described as open source and, and discussed in such a way that no one would ever guess that we did this so that they could have freedom because the open source way of talking about the issue doesn't raise these questions. It doesn't talk about right versus wrong. So if we, we say, if you distribute a program, it's your moral duty to distribute it as free software and respect the freedom of others. They wouldn't say anything like that because for them to criticize a common successful business model is too radical. They, you mustn't ever do that, according to them. So they would say, if you distribute a program, it's in your practical interest to let the users change it and redistribute it because they'll improve the code quality. Well, even if they're right, that's a secondary thing. And suppose they were mistaken, that can't justify a non-free program that tramples your freedom. <clears throat> The problem is that when people hear about our work or us, all they see in most cases is open source. In fact, there, I've seen articles that called me the father of open source. <laughs> now what use is it to be talked about if I'm associated with the wrong views? So I send a letter to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination <laughs> using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. <laughs> and then I explain what the free software movement is and what the ethical issue is and I hope that that way the people who read that periodical find out about the issue. But I can't do it all, we need your help. And one way you can help is every time other people are discussing a question using the term quote open source, you can intentionally not do what they're doing and instead say free libre software. And that way, you will show that it's a matter of freedom, even if they're not. And never go along and, and use their term just because there's so many of them who are doing that. You mustn't do that, because that just reinforces the tendency to forget the issue of freedom. And if people don't think about it, what's going to happen? Our future depends above all on what we value. If we want to make a long journey and arrive at some distant point, what we need to do to get there, above all, is not forget the goal. If we talk about open source, we will forget the goal of freedom. So one way we can prevent it from being forgotten is to talk about it every specific issue in this area we can discuss talking about free Libra software and not in terms of, well, or we could do it in terms of open source, but then we wouldn't be mentioning ethical issues. We'd be avoiding them. And what you say is up to you. But if you care about these freedoms, I hope you'll show it whenever you get a chance. It's easy to lose your freedom. Freedom is frequently threatened, and that applies to our field as well as others. <clears throat> In 1992, when Torvalds liberated Linux, people combined Linux with GNU and made a complete free operating system. But as it continued developing, as people developed the various <coughs> distributions of GNU slash Linux, they started putting in proprietary programs because they were thinking more of how many, 
how many features it could support than about people's freedom. And the result was, after some years, all the distributions were non-free. They all contained non-free programs. And there was no free distribution. 15 years ago or so, when people asked me, where can I get this system? I had to say, I'm sorry, but I don't know any place I could ethically recommend to you. There are many distributions, but they all contain non-free software. In other words, we had arrived at freedom and we had fallen back because most of the community didn't care enough to hold on to it. Well, I'm happy to say that there are now some completely free GNU slash Linux distros. For instance, there is Ututo, and there is BLAG, which stands for BLAG Linux and GNU. <laughs> and there is GNUsense, which is written as G New Sense. But it's a joke because it sounds just like my title as the head of the GNU project. I'm the chief GNUsense. <laughs> and there is Triskel. And there are a few more. Look at gnu.org slash distros for a list of the free distros. But you can already tell the well-known popular distros do not qualify. They continue distributing or suggesting the use of non-free programs, which means that for us to recommend them would be contrary to our principles. And nowadays, the source code of Linux, the kernel, is not entirely free software. Most of it still is, but some pieces are not. If you look at some of the supposed source files of Linux, you'll find a long table of numbers. These can be up to 300,000 numbers. And these tables are really proprietary programs, executables, dressed up as source code. But you can't make real source code for a program just by taking the numbers of the bytes in the executable and writing them down in digits. That's not source code. The real source code of those programs is not available, so they're non-free. And many of them explicitly carry non-free licenses, too. So what happened here? How did non-free software get into Linux? Well, Torvalds decided to include it. Because for him, it was never about freedom. He never believed that freedom for the user was a, something that the developer has to respect. He started developing Linux's proprietary software in 91. Then in 92, he made it free. And then some years later, he started putting in the non-free blobs, as they're typically called. What this shows is, when our freedom depends on somebody that doesn't value freedom, it's precarious. It might be lost due to a decision that he regards as merely practical convenience. Of course, he didn't do it frivolously. There was a practical motive, and that is there are some peripherals that won't work unless non-free firmware is installed into them when the machine is booted. And this kernel has to do that to make the peripheral work. In other words, these peripherals can't be used in the free world. So what do we make of that? That's a serious problem, but there are two reactions to it. One reaction is cover up the problem. Put non-free firmware programs into the kernel of your system, and then these peripherals will, will work, and the users won't realize that that's because they've left the free world. The other reaction, our reaction, is to say, it's a big problem that these peripherals can't be used in the free world. There is no software we could ethically suggest to you that will run them. And if you want freedom, you've got to replace them. So that's what we do. Whereas Torvalds 
added these non-free programs to his version of Linux, we have a version of Linux which we call Linux Libre, which doesn't have the blobs. So we have a deblobber script. Every time Torvalds publishes a new release of vanilla Linux, we run the deblobber and we make the new release of Linux Libre. And by the way, the symbol of Linux Libre is a penguin called Frido washing itself with a brush to clean <laughs> off the blobs. It's so cute. <laughs> because its facial expression is just wonderful for this. It's, it's sort of perplexed by what it's scraping off of itself. I mean, it's, you've got to see it. So anyway, of course, this gives us a kernel that's ethical, but it doesn't solve the underlying problem. We need to make those peripherals function in the free world. There are two ways to do that, either convince the manufacturer or do reverse engineering. If you want to make a, tech, a big technical contribution to the free software community, do reverse engineering. Find out the specs of these peripherals so that somebody else can then write a free driver or free firmware for them. Um, however, we've had some successes in convincing manufacturers to release free firmware. The Free Software Foundation will provide a certificate to products that can be used in the free world. And recently, for instance, we certified a couple of Wi-Fi devices because Atheros released the firmware that is needed to make its Wi-Fi chips work. Well, the other companies could too, and if we start pushing hard for the Atheros chip products, then maybe the other companies will feel the pressure. <clears throat> However, if you want to do the thing that we need most, become a free software speaker. We need to teach people to value freedom. We need lots of people speaking about this and writing about this and bringing it up whenever it's relevant in a discussion. This is what we are most short of. So if you're not a programmer, this is a way you can help. Of course, there are many other ways you can help. Look at gnu.org slash help for a list of different ways to help. And if you can't do one, maybe you can do another. You can join the Free Software Foundation, for instance. You can do that at fsf.org, or if you wish, you can pay dues here, if you prefer to pay cash. <clears throat> Nowadays, you might be writing, you might be running proprietary software and even proprietary malware without knowing that it was installed in your machine. Many websites send non free JavaScript code. which gets installed in your browser and gets run, and you don't even know it was installed in your machine. So if you don't want to let non-free software get into your machine that way, you've got to stop it. And we have a, a convenient way to stop it. It's called Libre.js. It's an add-on for Firefox and its derivatives. When it's running, it analyzes all JavaScript code that tries to install itself into your browser to see if it's either trivial or free. And if it's neither of those, then it uh, blocks that JavaScript code. And in addition, 
it helps you send a complaint to the webmasters. <laughs> you see, we need to convince thousands of websites to free their JavaScript code. That's going to take lots of complaints. Why don't people send complaints? Because it's too much hassle. You have to figure out where and how to send the complaint before you can complain. Well, Libre.js does that for you. It searches through the pages of the site looking for how to contact the webmasters, and you just have to click, and then you can start typing your complaint. And you don't have to be uh, articulate. You can just say, I couldn't use your site because it tried to make me run non-free JavaScript, and it wouldn't run without that. Uh, please fix it. That only takes you a minute. You could easily send 10 complaints like that every day. And it will help. Um, well, if all the software you run is free, then you have control of your computing that you do in your computer. You're free within your own computer. But we also use the internet. And as we have recently learned, thanks to a great hero, Edward Snowden, <laughs> we don't have much freedom in using the internet. It's full of surveillance. And now people are aware of this. They're aware how much surveillance is done of internet connecting, aware that many websites do surveillance on their users, and in addition, of course, they demand personal information before, or they refuse to operate, and this information is then available to Big Brother. And another problem that most people don't realize, haven't thought about, is there are servers that offer to do jobs for a user that are the user's own computing. Computing activities that are, that belong solely to that user and that that user should have total control over. Well, if that user confides the computing job to somebody else's server, it's the server operator who has control over it, and the user doesn't. And that's wrong. In fact, it's the same wrong as if that user were running a non-free program. There are two ways to lose control over your computing. One is, the, the sort of the older way is, if you run a non-free program. Then you've got a copy of the program, but you don't can't tell what it does and you can't change it. So you don't control it. But this newer way, which is called SaaS, or service as a software substitute, <laughs> has the same result, but through a different mechanism. Here's what happens. The, to use SaaS, the user has to send all the pertinent data to the server. And then the server does the user's computing, the same computing job, and eventually sends the result back to the user or takes action with others on behalf of the user. And the result is the programs that do this computing are running in the server. The user can't see or touch them. They're under the who controls them? Well, if they're free software, they're controlled by the server operator. If they're not free software, they're controlled by some third party, which is unfair to the server operator, but doesn't help the user. So either way, the user can't control that computing. So using SAS is inherently equivalent to running a non-free program. But it's actually worse. I've explained that some proprietary programs have spy features that send data about the use of the computer to some server. Well, with SAS, the user is required to send all the pertinent data to some server. It's the same result. 
the server has that data and will probably show it to the NSA. But it's even worse. I explained how some proprietary programs have a universal backdoor that allows some party to forcibly impose software changes at a distance, which means that that this typically is the owner of the program that can do this. It can change how the user's computing gets done without asking that user's permission to do so. Well, with SAS, the server operator can install different or additional software at any time, which changes how the user's computing gets done, and, and the server operator changes it without asking the user's permission. So, SAS is inherently equivalent to running a non-free program which is spyware and has a universal backdoor. So you must, for your freedom's sake, not use SAS. SAS is a small minority of websites. Most websites just publish information. Looking at the information they publish is not actually doing your own computing. It's looking at them. So the issue doesn't arise. But if we look at the sites that offer a non-trivial service, most of these services are some kind of communication with other people. And that's not your own private computing. You couldn't do that within your own computer. All you can do in your own computer is stuff that's totally yours. This is a joint activity. So there's no reason why you should expect to have full control over it and thus it doesn't raise the issue of SAS. But there are servers that offer to do things that are the user's own computing, things that you could do by running the appropriate program in your own computer. So if, an acti if a job is something that you could do by running the appropriate program in your own computer, is if you had the appropriate program, then it's yours, and those are the things you could have full control over, so you should have full control over them, and if a server does those things, it's SAS. So this is a danger of using the internet that most people aren't aware of, which complements the danger of uh, just abusing all the data that the servers collect about people. <clears throat> what it comes down to is we need to think very carefully about what data we are exposing to servers and which servers we use and what they're doing. We need to develop peer-to-peer -peer applications so that we're not talking with each other through servers all the time. And so, these are the things we need to do to have freedom in the internet as well as within our own computers. But note also the tendency to develop tablet computers which have so little local storage that they essentially push their users to store their data in some company's server and let their computing be done in servers belonging to others, which means making themselves vulnerable to massive surveillance and SAS. So if we don't want to be surveilled all the time, we've got to design our systems to minimize surveillance. This has to be what we think about when we develop systems and also when we decide whether to use them or not. This is why I don't have a mobile phone. Of course I can see how convenient it is. But there are some things it's our duty not to accept. 
I'm not going to accept Stalin's dream into my life, no matter how convenient it might be. And if enough of us start saying, I will not be surveilled, we can put an end to the surveillance. Um, so at this point, I'd like to mention places to get more information. There is, of course, GNU.org, the site of the GNU system and the free software movement. There is also FSF.org, which is the site of the Free Software Foundation. If you buy any of these things, it's the Free Software Foundation is what's selling them. We're raising money to support our staff. Now, that doesn't include me. I'm a volunteer. I'm a full-time volunteer for the Free Software Foundation because I'm asking you to volunteer and I figure that'll work better if I'm an example, if I'm doing the same thing I ask you to do. Except that if you volunteer part-time, that's useful also. But I feel so much commitment to the cause that I work on it full-time. But we have staff that are paid. And if you join the Free Software Foundation, you'll help us pay them. On fsf.org, you'll also find a lot of campaign activities. Many of them are things that you can sign. For instance, our, our main campaign right now is against the World Wide Web Consortium, demanding that it not include DRM as an official part of, <clears throat> of HTML. Basically, uh, it's selling its soul to companies like Netflix that want to attack your freedom. And if we hope eventually to put an end to DRM, our institutions that are important must oppose DRM. We must insist that they do so. Even if that won't by itself win an immediate victory, it's their duty to be on the ethical side, the side of our freedom, and not on the side of those who wish to impose restrictions on us. And there are other campaigns there too, which you can sign. There are also useful resources for doing your computing in the free world. So now it's time for me to present my other identity. <laughs> I am St. Ignatius <laughs> of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. <laughs> Emacs started out as an extensible text editor I wrote, which then developed into a way of life for many users because it was extended so much they could do all their computing inside Emacs. And then it became a church with the launch of the news group alt.religion.emacs, <laughs> which you might find amusing to visit. In the Church of Emacs, we have no services, only software. 
We have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs, and we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> to be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must pronounce the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> <laughs> then, if you become a true expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, <laughs> in which you chant a portion of our sacred scripture, that is, the system source code. <laughs> We also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs, which refers to anyone who has never used Emacs. <laughs> and according to the Church of Emacs, offering the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is a blessed act. <laughs> we also have the Emacs pilgrimage, which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in <laughs> alphabetical order. <laughs> There is a Tibetan sect which holds that it's sufficient to invoke them automatically under the control of a script, but the mainstream church believes that in order to gain spiritual merit from this pilgrimage, you must type them by hand. The Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches that I won't name. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. <laughs> but it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control or set up for your regular use and then install a wholly free operating system. <laughs> and then use and install only free software with and on the system. If you make this vow and you live by it, you too will be a saint and you'll have the right to wear a halo if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> There is a traditional rivalry between Emacs and the other editor, VI. <laughs> so people occasionally ask whether it is a sin in the Church of Emacs to use VI. It's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> but using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> And people have occasionally asked whether my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. But it was a computer disk in a previous life. Thank you. Now it's time for the auction. <laughs> this is an adorable GNU <laughs> that needs a home. So I'm going to auction it on behalf of the free, uh, for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you buy it, I'd be happy to sign the card for you. I'll also sign the books. Uh, by the way, if you have a penguin at home, you need to get a GNU for your penguin because as we all know, a penguin can hardly function without a GNU. <laughs> uh, we can accept payment in cash or with credit cards or with checks. How about Bitcoin? No, sorry, we can't, because I don't know how much it's going to be worth by the time the episode. <laughs> I've got to take the bids in one currency, which here will be dollars. And when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount. $20. 
Uh, 25 is the usual. <laughs> I've got to start with the usual price, which is $25. Do I get 25? 26. Uh, I'd rather go by fives, actually. All right. You can bid 25 if you like. 25. I've got 25. Do I get 30? 30 right here. 40? Did you say 40? I've got 40. Do I get 45? 45. I've got 45. Do I get 50? I've got 60. Do I get 65? I've got 60. Do I get 65? 80. I've got 80. I've got 80. Do I get 85? I've got 100. Do I get 110? I've got 100. Do I get 110? I've got 100. Do I get 110 for this adorable? I've got 100. Do I get 110? I've got a hundred. Do I get one ten for this adorable canoe that needs a home? One ten to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. One ten. I've got oh. one ten. Do I get one twenty or more? Do I get? One I've got one thirty. I've got one thirty. Do I get one forty or more? I've got 130. Do I get 140? Or... I've got 140. Do I get 150 or more? What? I've got 160. Do I get 170 or more? I've got 160. Do I get 170 or more for this adorable <laughs> home? 170 or more to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Last chance. How much? 170 or more? 170? Do, do you bid? 170. I've got 170. Do I get 180 or more? 180. I've got 180. Do I get 190? What? Do I get 190 or more for this adorable gadoo that needs a home to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? Do I get 190 or more? Last chance to bid 190 or more. Last chance going, going. 200. I've got 200. I've got 200. Do I get 220 or more? You want? Okay, I've got 220. Do I get 240? I've got 220. Do I get 240? 240 or more for this adorable <laughs> to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Do I get 240 or more? Last chance to bid 240 or more. Last chance. 240. Ah. I've got 240. Do I get 260 or more? Do I get 260 or more? I've, I, I want to go up by 20 now. <laughs> So we'll get the auction finished sooner. I've, I've got 240. Do I get 260 or more? Uh, no, I'm not taking an increase of just 10 now because I want to. It's got to be at least 20. It's got to be at least 20. <laughs> It's got to be 260 or more. Do I get 260 or more? 260. I've got 260. Do I get 280? I've got 260. Do I get 280 or more? 280 or more for this adorable canoe to defend freedom? Do I get 280 or more? Last chance. Last chance. Do I get 280 or more? Going. Going. Gone for 260. So, how would you like to pay? I don't have a debit card, but you can go to an ATM and take cash out. Uh, can I get a down payment? <laughs>
can't run it here. I have nothing to do with it. I could use a credit card and we'd make it like a phone order, but okay. I don't think we can Is do that with a credit card. Yeah, you can yeah. run on <laughs> all debit card dash. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, there's a, there's a, there's a place nearby. I'm not sure. Okay. Oh, does anyone know where there's an ATM? <laughs> shut up if you please shut up if you don't know where there's an ATM. <laughs> what? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. If their ATM is not running free software, that's their loss. <laughs> we don't have to boycott a company because it's running non-free software. We hope that they escape. I guess 200 for my friend. And 600 Thank you. Thank you. I'll sign it later after the question. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Questions. Uh, so I'm a little bit I'm a little bit confused about the PSDs. Is it mostly because of the device drivers that they use? The, you mean the blobs? Okay, blobs. Yeah, the binaries. Well, it's it's firmware typically. So does the firmware also need to be uh, completely open? I don't I don't call for anything to be open. I champion freedom respecting free software. Okay, so then <coughs> open is the term used by people who disagree with this philosophy. So then the free, free BSD would not count under GNU? Sorry, there's a confusion here. Free BSD is a variant of the BSD operating system. BSD, like GNU slash Linux, is basically free, but it's it has no free distros. All the distros of BSD include or offer some non-free software, and typically they have blobs. The same kind of, except they use the word blob to mean something different, and this causes misunderstandings. But using the term blob in the way that we use when talking about Linux the kernel, there are blobs in the BSD systems also. So That's why they fall short. So is there a new version of a BSD? Or? I don't know what that means. That's <laughs> nonsense. It's like asking, is there a, a European version of America? I mean, <laughs> BSD is one system and GNU is another system. It, having no blobs, it's a mistake to call that a GNU version. You know, we have Linux Libre, which has no blobs. But we don't call that a GNU version of Linux. It's it's Linux with the blobs gone. <coughs> now you could find you could I'm sure you could write a deblobber script for BSD kernels. I don't know if anybody's done it. So you mentioned that in the seventies when you opted to write the GNU. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. You mentioned that in the seventies and eighties when you opted to write software rather than to make a political movement? Um, well, no. In, the, in the 1983 is when I started this political movement and also started working on components of the GNU system. Sorry, so in 1983, um, you, know, you didn't have the political clout to make a splash in politics and pass some sort of bill that might enforce your principles. Now that you have a bigger name, have you rethought the possibility of maybe passing a bill to support these principles? Well, there are countries which are interested in migrating <coughs> public agencies to free software and are adopting policies more or less strong to do this. The US government is not very interested. The US government is basically plutocratic. It's under the control of the rich. And in each area of life, you can see that companies are demanding and usually getting whatever suits them, no matter how much damage it does to everyone else. 
well, in the software field, which of the companies you think tell the US government what to do? It's the big software companies. Uh, well, Software Freedom Day is a day when people are encouraged to set up events to promote and install free software. Now, in the past, a lot of what they did was promoting the use of non-free GNU slash Linux distros. I hope it will be better this year. Okay, well, first of all, yeah, copyleft is implemented legally based on copyright law. Due to a, uh, well, a change in copyright law that spread around the world, everything written is automatically copyrighted, whether anybody thought about making it so or not. And that includes any program that's written. So. By default, copyright forbids copying, changing, redistributing the program. So, and in some cases even forbids running it. So how do we make a program free? The only way to make it free is through a declaration by the copyright holders giving users the four freedoms. And that's what we call a free software license. So essentially all free software licenses are based on copyright law. But instead of saying you're forbidden to do these things, the free software license says you're permitted to do these things. Copyleft is a category of free software licenses and the copyleft licenses, just like the other free licenses, are based on copyright law. Oh, um, well different pirate parties have different positions. What? The suite. Um, yeah, they, they propose to shorten copyright to five years. Now, that would be okay with me if it were done <coughs> in a way that was fair to free and proprietary software. But here's why it would work out unfair. If you release a free program, that means the source code's available. If the copyright ends in five years, copyleft also ceases to be effective. So Microsoft or Apple could take all that code and put it into a proprietary program after five years. On the other, now that would be okay if we could turn it about and do the same thing to their code, but they never release the source code. All we would have in five years is an executable covered by an end user license agreement restricting us. And so we wouldn't be able then or ever to put their code into our free software even though it's in the public domain. So this effect is harmful to users' freedom and to free software. So what I said was I could support five-year copyright if this unfairness gets prevented somehow. What I suggest is make the proprietary software companies put their source code in escrow, and five years later it'll get released in the public domain. This way, the effect would be this, of the five-year copyright would be the same for us and for them. And then I'd say, okay. I have a question related to education and the free software movement. So it's the idea that the four freedoms uh, in one sense might not be inherent to software if the user doesn't have the knowledge uh, to understand the source code or the, the know-how to distribute the source code or change it. Well, that's too bad, but it's, you can't consider that a similar issue because these issues are a matter of not treating other people unjustly. 
However, if a person doesn't know how to program, that's not a sign that someone is treating him unjustly. Lots of people <coughs> don't have the uh, mental talents to be good programmers, or they're not interested because they're fascinated by something else. Uh, you know, it's not a sign that somebody has done you wrong that you're not a programmer. Right. Just as if you're not a musician, that doesn't mean, so, that's not a direct indication of somebody's el somebody else's el injustice to you. I'm sorry, it, all users can take advantage of these freedoms, at least indirectly. You can hire a programmer to make changes for you if you've got the four freedoms. You don't need to know how to do it yourself. But not everyone wants to be a programmer. Not everybody's mind leans toward that kind of thinking. There are people who, if they try to be programmers, will be as bad at it as I would be at painting. So really, what's, it's ridiculous to insist, to try to insist that everybody's got to be a programmer or that we should go to crazy lengths to help everybody be a programmer. Freedom is basically saying you could be a programmer. If you want to try to be a programmer, you're free to try. We're not all equal in our capacities, but we can have equal rights. Is there a way to make the SAS model compatible with free software? No. A technological solution? No. Based on there is nothing, I can't think of anything that can make SAS ethical. So there's no way that we could develop a system for users. I'm sorry, I don't there. think of any, I don't see any technical fix to this. What about compliance with the Franklin Street state? Well, first of all, that's just a preliminary statement. And second, what it says about this is don't do SAS. Uh, I don't see how he could run a server and each of us would control what that server does for... Professor Computing. What? If, if you have to sign it on his machine in order to run it, and you would have to go that change. No, in order, for me to ch in order for me to control it, it would have to be running my copy of these programs. You can insist that it only runs if you sign it and allow your own copy. Well, but then why do I want to use his server? It's, it's meaningless. It's $10,000 versus $1,000. Well, that's not what they're doing. The things that SAS is doing are things we could do in our in computers we could buy. But hypothetically, in the case we're discussing, wouldn't we be able to achieve And that? it wouldn't be anything like SAS. It would be just a computing platform that we could run our programs on. Oh, well, that's a different scenario. It's a totally different practice. I'm not against saying, here's a computing platform, run whatever you like on it. They could offer us virtual machines and we can load in our systems and run them. In fact, they already do that. <laughs> uh, but it's different. It's something else. By the way, I should mention two things about education since someone over there brought up education. First of all, schools should teach only free software. <laughs> And this is partly because the school's mission is to graduate good citizens of a strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free society, and not to implant dependence on somebody. But teaching proprietary software is implanting dependence. It goes against the social mission of the school. And this is why some proprietary developers offer gratis or cheap copies of their non-free software to schools. It's the same reason drug pushers offer gratis doses of addictive drugs. They say, uh, the first dose is gratis. Once you're dependent, then you've got to pay. And the schools are helping them do this. They're helping get students addicted to non-free software. They shouldn't do it. 
but it's also about knowledge. You see, a non-free program is the enemy of the spirit of education. Every program embodies knowledge, and if it's proprietary, that's knowledge withheld. And therefore, since the school has to show its loyalty to the spirit of education, it must not tolerate proprietary software. But the deepest reason is for the sake of moral education, education and citizenship. The school has to go beyond just teaching facts and skills and teach the spirit of goodwill, the habit of cooperating with other people. Therefore, every class must have the following rule. Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with everyone in the class who wants them, including the source code in case someone wants to learn, because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, bringing proprietary software to class is not permitted. Any, in any case, the same argument that the users must have control over the work applies to any work that is designed to be used to do practical activities. Software, of course, is, with a few exceptions, such as the obfuscated C contest, it's designed to be used. <laughs> And therefore, the users must have control over it, and that requires the four freedoms. But in addition, textbooks must be free. Reference works must be free. Recipes for cooking must be free. Fonts for presenting paragraphs of text must be free. Cooking recipes are not eligible for copyright. Well, yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> the, the substance of the recipe is not covered by copyright, but the wording is. But I'm saying that even the wording should be free. Also, designs for 3D printing of useful objects, that is not merely decorative, must be free. <clears throat> And if you're at all involved with 3D printing, please campaign to insist on publishing only free object designs when the object is useful. So I've heard it argued that copyleft is dead or copyleft is dying. And usually the argument Well, our enemies, the people who are against copyleft, <laughs> Say that because it's psychological warfare. Sure. Um, can I? So most of the arguments that I hear bring up first the split between GPLv2 and GPLv3, which I, I don't fully understand. Well, we made a new version because it's better. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you why, but that's a tangent for right now. When we published an article saying why, so the point is. Uh, a lot of developers have moved to GPLv3, but there are a few, such as Mr. Torvalds, who are against it, and I can tell you why he's against it. GPLv3 does several different things to protect users' freedom better. One of them is, it says you can't put the code into a tyrant device. If you distribute binaries, that are connected with a product, and there's, then you've got to give the users with the source code also the information about how to install their modified versions into the product that they bought. Well, Torvalds is against that. He wants Linux to be used in tyrant devices, and that's why he's against GPLv3. It's that simple. He dislikes it because it protects people's freedom better. Now, if I had thought of the possible danger of tyrant devices in 1991 when I published GPL version 2, I would have taken steps then to prevent it. But I never had heard of or thought of a tyrant device in 1991. So, I wrote a license that is used quite a bit, but, but it isn't perfect. GPL version two. So sorry, can I just say one more? Yeah. So 
so you think that the sort of balkanization of the copyleft world that happened, because GPLv2 and V3 are not fully compatible. That's right. So, so the problem is that there are developers that don't want to allow GPL version 3. Now, we've also, we have a way to prevent this balkanization, and that is release under GPL version N or any later version. That's what we recommend. But Torvalds decided not to do that because he had basically come to hate us. <laughs> and then when he saw we were going to protect the users from tyrant devices and make sure that they had the practical option of installing their change versions and not just a useless theoretical freedom, he was against that. So that's what caused the balkanization. Blue shirt. So, well, I guess the big question is, um, besides for the political aspect and the noble aspect, why would anybody who publish content if they would never get well, well, actually, that's uh, this. This sorry, there's a misunderstanding here. The issue of free software has nothing to do with who gets credit. There are free software licenses generally have requirements about indicating the copyright, indicating the authors and who changed it, and so on. Now, the reason. The, the, the reason that an issue arises about calling GNU Linux is because GNU is an operating system. It's, a, it's not a program. It's a collection of thousands of programs. And so there's no license for that. The individual programs have free software licenses, various different ones. But GNU as a whole is not one work. So that's why none of these licenses relate at all to what name you're going to call this combination. But in fact, we do get credit for our individual programs. The various authors do. And in any case, why would people write free software is a silly question. It's like asking, why would airplanes, airplanes fly? Well. The question, when phrased that way, implies that they don't yet. And it's just as wrong to ask, why would people write free software as why would airplanes fly? In fact, airplanes do fly, and lots of people develop free software. So you might want to ask why they do develop free software. And I wrote a page, gnu.org slash philosophy slash motivation.html, I think. Maybe it's motivations, plural, I, I can't remember for certain. Which lists eight motivations I have seen. But how, I can't get around this question. How did you eat for 30 years? With my teeth. With <laughs> <laughs> my mouth. How did you pay for your food? I did some paying work of various kinds. In the 1980s, I, when I started getting paid to make changes in free programs, I discovered that my income went way up. <laughs> I was charging $200 an hour. And I found that I could make enough money for a year in seven weeks of work. And enough money for the year meant one third to spend, one third to save, and one third for taxes. Because <laughs> I've always been one for saving money. Uh, so basically, you're making some naive assumptions which turn out not to fit the empirical facts. <laughs> Another thing is, lots of people are unemployed due to plutocrat-imposed right-wing economic policies. And while you're unemployed, you might as well do something useful that will also give you, as a, as a nice byproduct, 
to serving humanity, it will give you a portfolio that you can show anytime you're trying to get a job. What are your thoughts on uh, proprietary data in existence in like a MySQL database or an Oracle database? What well, do I'm, I don't think that I don't you think that's an, a meaningful term. The distinction between free and proprietary that I make is meaningful for a work. Now, a mere collection of facts is not a work. And the ethical issues raised by that database are of different kinds. Like maybe it shouldn't exist at all. Or maybe it doesn't raise any issues. Like there's a database of where every subway train is. And I don't see any problems with that database. What's fine? Of course, they ha I hope they have that database. It's <laughs> nice. It would be nice to make it available so we could all run programs over it. Uh, but there's no big ethical issue there. So, uh, in late 90s, I was a developer on the Windows operating system. And now I pay developers to write open source. It's not free, but open source. Software. Well, wait. How is it licensed? Today's software MIT license. Well, that's free software. You, it's, the term MIT license is misleading. It's used for two different licenses, so I rec recommend not using that term. But they're both lax permissive licenses, and those are free software licenses. A lot of people have been, mis have been misinformed. They have been told a definition of a wrong definition for free software, which is actually the definition of copyleft in software. And this seems to be an example of this error. The definition of free software is it comes with the four freedoms. Those licenses carry the four freedoms, so they're free software licenses. Okay, so, um, so thank you for developing free software, and thank you for paying programmers to work on it. And if you called it free instead of open source, you'd be supporting our movement. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to call it free necessarily, but am I, are you saying I'm on the path of redemption? What <laughs> you're <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not about redemption. It's about treating people ethically or not. And it's about defending your own freedom or losing it. You are, if you're releasing these programs under those licenses, they are free software, so you're treating other people ethically. <coughs> you could defend their freedom better by copylefting these programs, but what you're doing isn't wrong. So thank you. <laughs> On the other hand, by using those non-copyleft licenses, you're creating a risk that somebody else will make them proprietary. So users might be running your code but not having freedom. If they got it directly from you, they would have freedom because your license is a free license. But because it's a lax permissive license, some middleman might pass it along as proprietary software and the users that get the code through him will not get the four freedoms. That won't, you will not have done them wrong. The middleman is the one who will have done them wrong. But you could stop the middleman, and that would be better. Uh, so a common trend with code developers is you compile JavaScript because it's big and then you can make it smaller and it goes faster. Is what it makes it unreadable. There's nothing wrong with compiled programs, but you've got to point people at the source and put on a free license. So is the source itself, even though it's interpretable, like still a violation? Please, I don't understand you. Because it's, it's not source. If you pro source code is the form of a program that is most suited to understanding and changing it. If you process that source and get something else, that something else is not source. It's made from source. <coughs> There's no real difference between JavaScript and C as regards this issue. You know, if you generate some C code with Bison, 
That C code's not the source. The source is the input to bison. I don't know what those things are. <laughs> I want to ask two questions at the same time. One is just the word patents, and the second is talking about government surveillance and so forth. How do you buy books so that the government cannot say, well, look, you've got this and this and this? Okay, well, let me answer, okay? First of all, regarding patents on computational ideas, they threaten the rights of all computer users and they shouldn't exist. Look at endsoftpatents.org. Endsoftpatents.org. And I published a solution to the problem, a proposed solution for the US in Wired Magazine last November. Second, with regard to how do I buy books, it's simple. I go to a bookstore, I hand over cash, I take away the book, and the store doesn't know who I am and doesn't put anything in any database. Well, then I can't buy it. So uh, you should never buy anything from Amazon. Look at stallman.org slash amazon.html for the reasons you shouldn't buy from Amazon. What about the actual, uh, so let's say I'm a developer. Should I avoid .NET or? Oh, certainly. <laughs> because if you write a program which only runs on a proprietary platform, it's trapped. Even if your program is free, a person can't use your program and be free because your program requires him to run some non-free program and that takes away his freedom. So then presumably the libraries I use should also be... Of course. <laughs> well, if, you're, if the idea is someone else will get to run this, then you're mistreating the someone else. If only you were going to run it, then you're mistreating yourself by using that non-free software. I hope you'll stop, but I, you know, doing something harmful to yourself is not the same kind of ethical issue as doing wrong to others. I can ask a question. Don't be a few assumptions along the way. This is among the most sympathetic crowd to your message. But I look around the room, there's a lot of Mac folks. There's a lot of non-free stuff. And part of the reason is that free software sometimes is a pain in the ass. Um, want to want to make it better? Yeah. Join in and work yeah, on it. Here's the assumption part. Here's the assumption part. Part of the motivation for volunteer labor resides also in kind of making your individual contribution. And is this a constructive and, question? Yes. I, I, I don't see that it could be. Yeah, it could Basically, be. if there's around. a thing you think we should be doing better, it's no. up to you. I, I, I'm concerned that the model of organized volunteer does not yield software then what are you going to do about it? I think it's it's very simple. We have done the best we know how to do. And we're making it better all the time. But if you think it falls short, do something about it. Well, my mother doesn't know any programming, and she's using GNU slash Linux. So I don't know about that. The, the point is that there's no use in saying it's inconvenient having freedom because it's not as smooth as surrendering to chains. We have a mission, and some of us are working hard on this mission, and we haven't done all of what we would like. I don't need you to tell me that. The point, the, but 
implicitly, if your conclusion from observing this is that there's something wrong with us, then you're starting with the wrong premises. How much have you done to make this better? I'll tell you what I'm doing to make this better. I go around giving speeches like this, urging people to help. Have you, if you've got a better idea, try it. The novel is too chaotic for... If you've got a better idea, try it. Otherwise... You're not going to have consensus outside of a hierarchical structure. Well, we can't have a hierarchical structure and all be free. Right. The fact is, I can't tell everyone what to think. I can only show them my arguments and see if I persuade them. So if your suggestion is, let's set up a worldwide dictatorship and see if it can move the world towards free software, uh, I'm not very, uh, I don't find that very appealing. On the other hand, there are governments which are planning the migration of their own activities to free software. They tend to be governments that don't want the U.S. and U.S. companies <laughs> dominating them. You still work on Herd? I never worked on the GNU Herd. <laughs> that was never my personal <laughs> software project. I Other you people said you did. You wanted it. to work on an advanced. No, I chose the design, and that's all I did. The FSF hired people to work on the Herd. Anyway, it's getting late. This was supposed to end at nine. So I'm declaring the questions over. But now there's time to buy stuff. And also, if you've already bought a book, I can sign it.